Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on the second day of the new chapter here in the new studio at uh, Suite 888. And because in Chinese that's a lucky number, I'd like to say it's Suite 888888888. You know, as much as, as much as good luck as you can possibly get. And our special guest today is uh, Tim Motz. He's the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii here on United. Aloha United, we stand. We're going to call this show The Boys and Girls Together. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for being here. You know, so which, can we sing together? <laughs> I, I wonder if the name Ed Hurley come to mind. <laughs> this is back in New York when I was a kid. Ready, boys hey. and girls together, <laughs> me and Mamie O'Rourke. That's a great song. <laughs> Something about the west side right. of New York, the east side of New right, York. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so reminiscent, and I, I, I'm sure it wasn't completely accidental that you called it the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've actually been around as a national movement for over 150 years, and you mentioned the East Coast. It started on the East Coast about 150 years ago, and now, unbelievably, we've grown to the largest youth service agency in the world. So there's four million kids each year that are being served by the Boys and Girls Clubs within America. That's wonderful. You know, I really like elementary organizations that are here to stay. A hundred years says volumes about you, volumes. How did you get into this, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I was a young child, um, there were many opportunities to be engaged, some in good ways, some in bad ways. I was pretty fortunate in the sense of having my family around and you weren't a juvenile delinquent, were you? Well, that would be a strong word, but I, but I will say the way I got into the organization was um, I had an opportunity when I was in college to be living with some friends, and there was a local community center. Uh, and I always told people the, re the reason why I went in the back door over the gate so the front door was just closer to my house, but I think we know the real answer. So I was in there playing racquetball, and um, you know one of those things you get the blast from your childhood? My name is Tim, obviously, but as a child it was Timmy. And you're in there playing racquetball, and all of a sudden the door opens, and you hear someone say, Timmy. And you just freeze, because you know no one has called you that for many, many years. So it had to be someone from my sure. childhood. Yeah, wow. Well, long story short, the individual said, I, I didn't know you belonged uh, here, and I didn't have the heart to tell her that I didn't. And she said, well, um, come down on Tuesday, and I'll tell you how you can work out here for free. Again, not having the heart to tell her that I already was by, by breaking in the back door. So I went down that day, and these ladies keep asking me questions. And afterwards, they said, what does this have to do with me working out for free? And they said, well, if you join our organization, uh, you get to work out for free. So that started my work in nonprofit. And then about halfway through my tenure uh, with that organization, um, I had gotten to the point where I was really fortunate and ro rose to a level of executive where I was doing a lot of volunteer work, but I wasn't working with the kids as much. And someone shared with me, they said, you know, if you want to be inundated with kids every day and still do the good work with adults, you need to engage in the Boys and Girls Club. So I had that opportunity, and very fortunately back in, uh, it's been since 2006, I've been working with the Boys and Girls Club now, and I've loved every day since. See, there's almost 10 almost, years, nine almost years, 10 anyway. years, yeah, nine years now. So yeah. it's been incredible, what a journey. Um, but I tell you, having, there's nothing like having your office and having a couple hundred screaming kids right outside your door. It's a, it's a rewarding and challenging experience at the same time. So how, did, how, how was it when you first joined it? Can you give us a snapshot of the moment you, know, you, you started? Absolutely. So you, you walk up to this building, and, and Boys and Girls Clubs are really building-centric places. You know, it started a long time ago saying a safe haven, then a positive place for kids, and now we say it's where great futures start. Yeah. So you walk up to this building, and there's kids. I mean, you can imagine buses pulling up, vans with kids being dropped off, kids walking. So people are coming from all over the place after school, multiple locations. You walk up and you see this controlled chaos. There's no other way I can say it. You know, there's someone at the front door saying, welcome, welcome. These kids are getting scanned in, you know, with their electronic cards. There's staff outside. There's kids that are, I want snack. I want to do this. Other kids that want to run to the basketball court, you tell them not to run back there. And then, of course, then, then comes the dreaded news of, we got to do our homework first. No, 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 but I don't have any. Well, then, great. We'll have an opportunity for you to sit down and read for a little bit. Yeah. No, actually, I have homework. Okay, well, then you need to do that. So you can imagine this controlled chaos, but the one you know, formula is that you see these smile on these kids' faces. And they come in, and they're having really you know, an opportunity to engage with mentors, adults who truly care about them, know their names, know if it was their birthday, know if Aunt Sally is in town visiting, you know, a chance to really engage. And these are kids that come from all walks of life. A majority of them, though, one-parent household, 
or maybe no parents there at all, or parents are doing multiple jobs just to survive, you know, parking cars in the morning, serving drinks in the afternoon, and maybe doing something else at night. So really we're that, you know, positive influence. What ages are we talking about? We're talking 7 to 17 year olds. So in Hawaii, we actually serve 15,000 kids a year, believe it or not. We're the 48th largest boys and girls club in the country of the 4,000 clubs. Why do you attribute that to? You know, a lot of things. First, and, and, I, and I come from a positive place about this, is people in Hawaii get family. They get ohana. They get the fact that if they can't be there for their kids, it takes a village. They need someone to be there. So they make sure their kids, especially the younger kids, are coming to the boys and girls club. But where the phenomenon happens, though, is that our teens, Across the country, teens are a challenge. I just got back from a national conference, and they said our teen population is dwindling. It's not the case in Hawaii. There's only eight other clubs in the country that serve as many teens as we do. We serve thousands of teens every day, and it's because I believe our teens truly want to make a good decision in life, and they don't want to be somewhere where they're not making good choices. I give them all the credit in the world, because when I was 16, 17 years old, I got to be honest, I had different motivators at times that we've all had. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all in that boat. But these kids are making a choice to want to come to the club, make good decisions, still have fun, mind you, but you know, make them in a positive way. Yeah. So. Well, okay, we're going to take a short break. I'm going to come back, and I want to know more about exactly what you do for them and how they respond to you. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Here on Aloha United, we stand with Tim Motts, president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii. We're talking about boys and girls together. We're not going to sing it again, though. Once is enough in <laughs> any show. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading, cutting-edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs, too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for supporting us. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming, produ consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha. We're back. I told you we'd be back, and we are back. I'm here with uh, Tim Motz. He's president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club, club or clubs? Club, club. of Hawaii. Uh, here on uh, Aloha United We Stand, we're talking about boys and girls together. Um, but let's take a moment before we go too much further and say, What's the relationship between you and the Aloha United Way? Yeah, so we're really fortunate to be one of the partners of Aloha United Way. Um, as one of the larger youth service agencies, we believe that it takes a village, and there are a lot of nonprofits doing a lot of great work, and so we try to partner with the United Way. I'm fortunate to sit on the Community Impact Council, so I'm on that team that kind of looks at all the different ways nonprofits are helping. So not only do we get support from the United Way from a financial standpoint, we get resources, training opportunities, and we have the opportunity to kind of give back and take the pulse of the community. Huge issues, it's no secret, homelessness, um, challenges with seniors. You would think, well, how does that impact the Boys and Girls Club? Because we have some kids that are homeless. We have plenty of kids that are living you have with kids seniors. In, yes. in the Boys and Girls Club. In the Club. Boys and Girls Club, there are kids that are homeless. So it doesn't matter what the social ill is, the Boys and Girls Club needs to be part of that solution. So we're really fortunate to be able to partner with the United Way to be a part of that solution. Yeah, that's great. I want to talk to you about all these things. I know, I know. My mind is flooding with questions. <laughs> so the, but one thing we caught in the break was your schooling. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to uh, Cal Poly Pomona, which is in uh, Southern California. I think another reason why this is so near and dear to my heart, you know, it'd be easy if I said I was a straight-A student that sailed on through. Uh, that was not the case for me. I, I, I don't think, while my wife would argue, I don't think it was due to lack of intelligence. I think it was due to lack of drive at times and saying, well, I'll be just fine. But it took that one, you know, we always say it takes that one special adult in someone's life. Yes. For me, it was a history teacher in community college. That's interesting. He asked me a random question, and by some miracle, I happened to read the chapter that day. I don't know, maybe I wasn't feeling what good. Was the question? It was about history, and it was a question about the Civil War. 
and it was kind of an open-ended question. And he, he said, well, if this general would have you know, done something different, do you think the result would have been different? And I gave an answer, and luckily I had read, so I had some context, and he said, that was really great. You should consider my honors class. And I can tell you to this day, that changed the entire trajectory, because someone had taken a value and interest in, hey, you know, my input is worth sharing. So of course, I didn't want to let him down again. Then I got into the honors class, and I have to be one of the few people that my GPA was at its lowest point in high school. Then community college got a little bit better. Undergrad, it got better, and then I graduated with my master's degree with doing pretty well. So, right. But it literally, it comes to the adult who says, you know, your input is valued here. And that's all it took, just one adult. And, and that's why I believe that, you know, the whole recipe of a Boys and Girls Club. So that took me to Cal Poly, then on to do my master's work at Loyola Marymount in counseling. In so, counseling. In counseling. By the yeah. way, on your point about one, you know, one specific moment, <clears throat> one interaction and engagement <clears throat> with one individual, I absolutely agree with mm -hmm. that. There's so many people who sit in that chair who have had the same experience. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And you know what? From the other side of the equation, isn't it wonderful to be that person? That's right. To, to, to generate a, a, a career, a, a new confidence, a, 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 <clears throat> you know, a way to deal, a way to deal with the world. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's a real mitzvah, which is a Yiddish word <laughs> meaning good deed. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay, so counseling. Sure. What is counseling? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, in, 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 to narrow it down, it's meeting someone where they're at and helping them uh, great clarity around their, their challenges. So it's not about someone sitting down and saying, I'm going to analyze you and here's your issue. It's being able to sit with someone and let them talk through where their, their issues are and challenges, and that's what we do with kids every single day. We have no idea what they go through. We don't know the challenges they're facing at home, but if we can meet them where they're at, give them maybe solutions, maybe it's resolution techniques, maybe it's a break from reality, maybe it's a game where they can take their aggression out on the court as opposed to on their little brother, whatever that is. And so that's what counseling is. It's be able to put someone in a place, in a safe frame of mind where they can explore where they need to go. And that's, that's exactly what we do in the clubs as well. You know, in New York where I grew up uh, in the 30s, I guess, yeah, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and then already I was a kid in the 50s, <clears throat> there was a thing about social work. It was a career. All the best schools taught it and offered graduate degrees in it. There were many eleemosynary organizations that practiced it and encouraged it. And I mean, many people who, uh, had their lives touched by it. Uh, and it's something like what you're talking about. Is it what you're talking about? It is, in essence. You know, I, I talk about it in the sense of that it may not be case management, but. It, don't kid yourself that if we aren't meeting these kids where they're at, knowing their background, working with them and saying, our job is to take you from here to here, give you those opportunities, that's exactly what social work is too. It's being able to you know, cure all those ills. And the only way it happens is within the family. So I share with people, shame on us. If we're just working with those kids and then the doors close at night and we don't work with the families, if we don't engage them in family opportunities, uh, computer education classes, something like uh, healthy lifestyles programs, our local club here in downtown, there's a healthy family fit challenge that happens nationally each year. Our local club here in the last two years has had one of the five families a finalist the last two years in a row. And two years ago, two of the five families were from here and one was the eventual winner. Meaning we engage these families, help them, teach them how to eat appropriately, how to shop, how to stay active with their kids. Um, if we're not doing those wraparound services, that social work element, we're missing the boat because just because you change one thing doesn't mean the whole family is going to improve. So interesting, you know. <clears throat> I visited last year uh, Keala Kehe High School, mm. a big, huge high school in Kona Malka. A lot of kids there, and I didn't know, but there's a lot of Micronesian families there. That's where they wound up, and this creates uh, because they don't know the way of Hawaii or the way of the U.S. for that matter. Um, the families get in a pickle once in a while, and they have trouble integrating. <clears throat> and the school offers the family courses mm -hmm. in addition to what, this is a DOE school, right? Yeah. Very creative, you know, very Absolutely. open. Uh, and they have the, these parents come down, and they teach them all the things you were listing, how to go shopping, you know, how to, how to make a lease, you know, for a residence, uh, all the things you need to know 
to operate as a family in Hawaii. That's right. Uh, and it's critical because if you don't do that, then they wind up in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you're talking about the same thing, the wraparound notion. Yes. This is, this is only good. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Good, good. You're following the same, the same <laughs> path. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and then I wanted to give you, which I did during the break, you know, my perception of where we're going and see if you agree. We as a society, um, a lot of people are holding more than one job, uh, especially those in the lower income brackets. Um, and they work really hard for little money. Uh, and they are always uh, in desperation mode financially. And um, their, their kids uh, are latchkey kids and, and, and uh, may not be doing the right thing during, during their recreation time. Um, and they may have a negative attitude about school in general, mm -hmm. uh, where they, you know, they don't want to be a brain. They don't want to learn it. They, they just want to do what their peers are telling them. And there's no control on what their peers are telling them. And finally, what you mentioned earlier is the, the whole problem about homeless, which is all that stuff wrapped up into a really negative environment for these kids. And it sounds like one of the reasons that uh, Boys and Girls Club is, is, is relevant today and is successful today in the social, you know, the social safety net uh, is that you recognize that and you offer some relief from uh, the process that's going on in Hawaii. Am I right? Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, and I think it would be, it wouldn't do the issue de justice if you didn't explain all those factors that you just mentioned. It's so difficult. I mean, if, if you take that gap of, of where a family needs to get to and where they are in reality, if you don't have places like the Boys and Girls Club, and we mentioned all those other wonderful nonprofits that the United Way does, if you don't have someone giving someone, you know, a hand up, not just a hand out, but literally a hand up saying, here's a great place for your kids to go after school. Do what you need to do. Get your education. Take that second job. Whatever it takes to, to keep your head above water, we're going to be there for you. And you're right. That's why we have kids that come out in droves. I'm astounded. If you took the amount of kids we serve, you, you must think, wow, you guys must have a lot of buses. You must have this creative. You must have this marketing program. Let me tell you, the old Field of Dreams movie, if you build it, they will come. We don't have a transportation program. These kids, these 15,000 kids, are finding their ways to the Boys and Girls Club every day after school because it is that beacon of light. And because these families don't have the time it's not like they don't want to be with the kids. It's just that they are trying to survive, like you mentioned. And kids are coming to our club in droves uh, because of all those challenges. And we really do believe we're changing their trajectory. You know, just a little story about that. We have a program called Youth of the Year. And I always tell people that's a two Kleenex box event. If you go to that thing um, and these kids talk about their challenges and their struggles. One of the boys last year is from our Ever Beach Club. This kid, I mean, big, but mild-mannered, he gets up and what he was talking about is reminiscing about the night that his family lost their home. They were on a remote road in Eva Beach and the family got foreclosed on and basically they were being evicted. And he talked about the fact that well, that was such a low light for him, but that in the coming days he had joined the basketball program at the club. And this kid is not small. I, I told him, I said, you're going to go, you know, he's probably like 6'5 and he's only 14 years old. Uh, but he started playing at the club and enjoying it. But it also convinced him to do other things at the club. Because what is the alternative? Be on the streets. So as he started doing that, he went into one of the financial literacy classes we give. Well, long story short is, he got his mom engaged in that program. And she, from them, made some better choices as it turned out to be, you know, with boyfriend and substance abuse. Uh, started learning to do how to do a budget. And, and now they are able to be in a home again. Because he taught her about how to manage money more effectively. That's the secret. That's, That's the, the secret. secret. It reminds me of uh, Midpac gave their kids, uh, somebody gave them a, you know, a big uh, uh, you know, uh, contribution, and they went out and bought uh, iPads for mm -hmm. all their kids, every kid, and the, I and the teachers had no idea how to run an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids were teaching the teachers. Now, there's a lot of secondary effect there. It bonds them up, yes. right? It makes the kid relevant, confident. Uh, it teaches him that, yes, he can participate actively in the family, be part of a decision process in the family. It makes the uh, parent much more proud. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, all positive things flow out That's of this. Right. Yeah. That's right. So make me a 16-year-old kid. My wife says I'm 16 anyway, <laughs> and I feel like I'm 16. There you go. Mentally. I mean, I never, <laughs> I, 
kind of got further than that. And I walk in the door and say, you know, things are really rotten. You know, we've lost our house or, you know, my parents are in trouble in some way. And, and uh, somebody told me I, I could come down to you, Tim, and you would give me um, a little uh, hope. Yeah. So what, what happens to me when I walk in the door? The first thing we're going to do is we're not going to talk at you and tell you what you need, because that's the last thing a 16-year-old wants to hear. They don't want to pitch. What we're going to do is we're going to put you in an environment, meaning the teen center. So that's the beauty of having a large-scale boys and girls club like us. We separate the kids. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're 16 or 60. What you do know is you don't want to hang out with a 7-year-old, right? 16-year-olds, it's, it's the opposite of cool to be hanging out with a 7-year-old in, in, in the game room. Somewhere there's the puberty mark. Exactly. <laughs> and, and that is, so, so those 16-year-olds will go in the teen center. There'll be a teen director in there. There'll be kids mulling around. It's the teen center, so it's a little more flexible. We're not telling a kid to look at 315 yet. You know, they're doing their thing in there. They're doing homework. Maybe they're sitting on a bean bag. Maybe they're, they've checked out one of the laptops on the Wi-Fi. It feels a little bit like a Starbucks internet cafe with a much better, you know, price tag for these kids. Great. Which, mind you, for the teens, it's a whopping $10 a year to be a part of the $10 club. $10 a year. And that's it. And if you can't have a, you know, if you can't afford that, we'll find a way for you to work off the $10. All right. Okay. Absolutely. So we turn no kid away due to inability to pay. So that kid's going to come in there. They're going to interact with other kids. And then some of those amazing things are going to start happening, which is they're going to go in there. And maybe they get ignored by a few of the kids because they're new. Maybe a couple kids approach them. A staff's going to come up, talk to them. You know, hey, how are you doing? What school did you go to? Um, and that kid's just going to slowly start integrating. We're not going to pressure anything. We're not going to have them sign up on a form and say, oh, you've got to join the dance class. Oh, don't forget, there's guitar lessons next week. Uh, you know, we're just going to let that kid interact. Maybe they just hang back, watch a kid play in video games because they finished their homework. Maybe they're just thrilled about the video movie production program we have, which is second to none. They're going to find, you know, their niche. But the most importantly, they're going to start building relationships with the kids in the building and the staff. Because the next time they come back, that staff's going to say, hey, Johnny, I haven't seen you in a couple days. Everything going good? You know, feel free. We're always here. And then if Johnny keeps coming back every day, hey, so what brings you to the club? We're going to find a way to start building that relationship. So what happens is they get this menu of opportunities. They have a safe place to be, which you would be amazed. We had a recent study. Our kids feel 20% more safe inside our club than they do at school which I thought is really interesting because we're literally right across the grass. So 60% of those kids say, I feel safe at school, but like 80, 82% of them feel like they feel safe at the club. Well, it's got something to do with the schools. I mean, I remember when I first came to Hawaii, everybody was talking about Kill Howley Day. I don't know if they still have that, but that was bad. That's very bad. And so these kids feel like, you know, you mentioned um, earlier about, you know, the different populations. Um, in our clubs, we tend to have a lot less tension in terms of racial tensions because every kid in there is a club kid. I don't care if you're black, yellow, white, green. And so our kids feel very safe. And so um, our local, our downtown club, they made a, these kids made a video and it went viral on Vimeo. And it was our, 75% of our kids in that clubhouse are Micronesian inside the teen center. And they made a video about being accepted. And you want to talk about impactful, these kids are on there talking, and then one kid is sitting on the steps of their school, and he turns to the camera and says, I'm not a cockroach. I'm not a, a waste on society. I'm not a burden. What I am is a, a kid who goes to the Boys and Girls Club who's going to make it in Hawaii and who's going to be successful. And yeah, exactly. And so that's that secret sauce. There's no other way to say it other than the secret sauce is to come in to feel empowered, to feel like this is your home. You know, it's a second home. When you hear these kids talk about it, they say, this is my second home. Auntie Lala, Auntie Lori, you know, Uncle That's Junior, your staff you're That's my about. staff. Yeah. These are my family. And, yeah. and, you know, that's that, again, secret sauce of why that kid, that 16-year-old, you know, they may come in tough and I don't need this place, but at the end they're like, you're right, I don't need this place, but this is my place. You know, this is where I belong. That's great. Yeah. I feel, I feel it. I feel yeah. it. I yeah. feel it. Um, one, one question before we take our next break, and that is, um, um, you know, is this the same as the boy, as the uh, uh, brothers, what do you call them? Big brothers and sisters. Big brothers and sisters. No, it's actually a different organization. Big brothers and sisters does fantastic work, and that's more of a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program uh, between adults and children. Our program is much more in a group setting. Uh, you know, to give you an example, our, our downtown site sees 250 kids a day. 
Um, so there, there's no way you would have that one. This is much more of a, a collaborative environment, the kids in different rooms moving, sports leagues, you know, different programs. There are mentors in there, but they're mentoring in a much more group mm. setting. Do, would you ever work some collaborative We do, yeah, oh, we do right? collaborate. And, you know, I was just with some of those agencies this morning at the United Way gathering, and, um, you know, we have a program. The Boy Scouts run a troop at one of our clubhouses. The Girl Scouts just started a troop at one of our, at our Nanakuli site. Um, uh, the Junior Achievement runs business programs at some of our clubhouses. So we're kind of seen as that go-to, you know, largest youth service agency, but we can't do it alone. So we bring in these other agencies to help us Those provide the services. Situations. Exactly. Let's take a break, and when we come back, I want to ask you about your staff and how you train them to give them the vision that you have, that you've uh, articulated. And, um, and how they, in turn, relate to these kids. I want to know about the professional aspect and, and the thought maybe that one of these days I could come down in my next career and be a member of your staff. Tim, <laughs> Tim Motz, President and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii. And here we are in Aloha United We Stand, talking about boys and girls together. This is Alice Lee Hagan, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leesom, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And, of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're having a lovely afternoon with Tim Motz, President and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii. You know, um, so much, this community needs you so much. Um, and, you know, I mean, the world is it's a nuclear family. It's a nuclear country, in a, you know. And I don't mean in weapons. <laughs> I mean in the way everything gets fragmented. But Hawaii is a different place, a different market, because the likelihood is that most of these kids are going to stay here. And, you know, one of the think tech's missions, or at least points of interest, is uh, are they going to be useful here? Are they going to be productive members of a society? Because if they're not, they're going to be a drag. Um, the whole place is ultimately going to devolve into backwater. It's a real risk. Um, and so we have to create, we have to love them, we have to incentivize them, uh, we have to encourage them in every way, give them the confidence they need to study and to apply their skills in a way that's productive for the community. And it sounds to me like you have a program along those lines, but that you have to execute the program through staff members. So this is not easy. I mean, what you're talking about, you make it sound easy, Tim, but it's not easy, uh, especially when you know, the stakes are so high. Yes. Uh, how do you get your staff to actually do this? Well, I think we start with a common goal. And, you know, you mentioned all those things that we have to do to engage those kids. And the one thing you didn't mention, which I know is implied, but we have to challenge them. We have to challenge them to do better. We have to challenge them to want to have a better life than their parents had. We have to challenge them to want to be even more productive, a better part of society. What, what does that look like? And our staff team, we have a very simple goal, which is we want to empower these kids to be the best they can be. Just right with our mission statement, you know, our mission statement to uh, you know, reach all young people, especially those who need us the most, to reach their full you know, productive production. 
And so how do you do that with the staff? Well, what you do is you have a framework. So we have academic you know, programs. We have good character and citizenship. And we have sports programs. So you have these umbrellas. And we say, how are we going to make sure that everything we do allows these kids to thrive? Not just survive, but thrive and be their own person. And so the way you do that is you tell these kids, you know, you came to us after school. I don't care what school you just walked to. I don't care if you walk down from that big school up on the hill where a president may or may have not have gone. I don't care if you were brought over here by um, a correctional facility. I, I don't care where you came from, but when you're in these walls, you're going to be challenged. If you like science, we're going to put you in our robotics program. I was just at our clubhouse in Kailua. We opened a brand new building last Wednesday at Kailua Intermediate School, and the kids were showing me the robotics program, prosthetic arms, and they were picking up bean bags and throwing these bean bags wow, with prosthetic great. arms. That's great. And you know that's the only way they're going to be able because if not, that gap continues to widen. So we challenge these kids and say, no, you can do this. You're not just going to hang out. We'll let you hang out. But well, that's fine from this time to this time, but now you got to join this program, you got to join this program. And our staff are so incredible because they get the best out of these kids. They care so much. All I can say is they just love them until they, they, they succumb and say, you know what, I'm going to be a part of this place. And so they engage in these different programs. And the staff, of course, there's methods to their madness. We have a power hour program. What that means is every kid in the club does homework for an hour each day. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting. So I'm sure what you're wondering is, how the heck do you get every kid to do an hour of homework? How do you do that? Well, in Power Hour, we partner with local community, with local businesses, with local foundations, and they give us gift cards or incentives. So the kids, imagine like Dave and Busters, they, as they do their homework and turn it in, they get points. Well, at the end of the month, they go into their, the Power Hour store and they get to redeem these points. And these kids are smart. Perfect. They're like, I'm not going to redeem them for about a year. Well, then they get to redeem them for a $75 <laughs> gift card to Foot Locker. Or, you know, uh, a, you know, how amazing. They'll get a big gift card to Buco de Pepo. And then they get to take their family, who can't afford to go out to dinner. And these kids get to treat their parents to dinner at Buca uh, because of the points they received at the Boys and Girls Club. Just a footnote. You have to bring a couple of them down next time we meet so we can meet them and say hi, see what they're like. I, I would love to do that. You know, I mentioned these Youth of the Years, and that's one of their roles is to go around and talk. We did an after-school summit last week, and it's to grab every nonprofit together who serves after-school programming. And we had one kid that got up to talk. And so it was the First Lady of, of Hawaii, Governor's wife. It was our superintendent. It was State Supreme Court Justice Mike Wilson and then our club kid. So you can imagine the lineup. Yeah. But when he got up there to speak, everyone is, like I say, Kleenex, and then everyone who followed the superintendent said, I don't need to say anything after what this boy talked about. But this, child, this young man, I should say, his name is Luke Rita. Uh, Luke has MS, or I'm sorry, cerebral palsy. Luke is mostly deaf. Luke wasn't supposed to see his 16th birthday. And Luke has spent the last 12 years at the Kapa'a Boys and Girls Club. And that's completely changed the trajectory of his life. I don't want to steal his thunder because I'd love for you to have him down. But when he talks about his family coming around him and sharing that the father had committed suicide um, due to the family challenges and how Luke had to pick up that slack. And if it wasn't for the Boys and Girls Club giving him the skills to do that, he wouldn't be where he is today. Uh, when you hear that, um, and you hear that now he wants to go to UH Hilo, and he wants to be a public speaking major. Um, when you hear that the Boys and Girls Club saved his life in that way, of which a Harris Poll study showed that 60% of our alumni, 16 million alumni across the country, say the club saved their life. Not just changed it, saved their life. Um, it's best Are most of these the kids. kids underprivileged? You know, I would say in Hawaii, a, a good portion of them are, and across the country that is the case as well. Uh, low income families, um, a majority of them, are coming from families that make twenty-five to, you know, forty thousand dollars a year for the whole family, that's and, in, poverty. and in Hawaii, that's poverty. Um, the beauty is, you get some kids that are come from, you know, very well off, and you get the kids that are, like I said, homeless. But a majority are in those communities where it's just um, having a hard time making ends meet. Uh, you know, the snack program we provide after school is huge for these kids because you don't know what dinner they're going to get that yeah. night, yeah. and so that's why um, I think when they say the club saves their life because it truly is a lifeline. 
<clears throat> on the other side of it, I want to offer this comparison. <clears throat> you know, we cover the science fair a lot. What sticks in my brain about the science fair is that there's a uh, metamorphosis involved. Uh, when these kids, and they could be ordinary kids, you wouldn't tell them the difference with them and any other kid, but when they do a science project, they are required, challenged, to, to tell people, tell strangers, tell uh, science judges and the public um, about their project, about why they're doing it this way, how they're doing it, what they learned, how they learned it. I mean, all these questions that kids don't normally, you know, address. Mm -hmm. But now these kids are being asked to present. And it gets them through a barrier to be able to talk to the public, to strangers, about a, sort of a common language way up here. Mm -hmm. And it changes their lives. And they develop a confidence that can take them into a career of science. And every time you talk to a successful uh, science uh, fair competitor, you see this in front of you. And it sounds like it's also an element in what you do. It is. We, we, we want these kids to um, be their own person, but pr project themselves. Um, it's no secret that a lot of the kids in the lower income communities don't have the same opportunities. Uh, you know, I, I had a wonderful um, volunteer who helps with these robotics programs and computer literacy programs. And they said, you know, the challenge is that kid may be in Kali'i, if he walks a across the street into his neighbor's garage, the, the odds are that guy isn't an astronaut or isn't a scientist who this kid is just going to naturally learn from. We need to be intentional about getting them exposed and then having these kids present out and say, look what I have created. That's why we have partners like NASA. So this week NASA is in Kauai for about six weeks doing some analysis. So they're spending their days. We, we get grants from NASA and they're in our boys and girls clubs in Lahui and in Kapa'a teaching our kids some of the, the cutting edge things that NASA does. Because if our kids aren't exposed to it, what, where are they going to get that opportunity? Right. And if they are exposed, it's fabulous it to is. get that opportunity. It is. <clears throat> we have a few minutes left, and I want to ask some questions that, that, uh, that are a little edgy, if you don't mind. I mean, <clears throat> boys and girls, 7 to 17, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Boys like girls. Well, after a point. Yes. They like girls. And girls like boys. Yes. At an earlier point, most times, the girls like the boys before the boys like the girls. <laughs> I always said the girls are smarter. <laughs> but, but how do you deal with that? Because, I mean, that's, you know, it's, this is <clears throat> emerging. This is yes. the, the, you know, the puberty, uh, the metamorphosis. How do you deal with that? I, I would say that my answer probably is just as edgy as your question, if not edgier. Um, it actually, to me, is, is one of the, the most incredible things about the Boys and Girls Club because they're in this safe environment to make good choices, to make bad choices, but it's still a safe environment. There's an incredible doctor out of Philadelphia who's actually a pediatrician, and when they talk about all the different parenting styles, you've probably heard of helicopter parents, you've heard of this, that. He calls it lighthouse parenting, and that's what we do at the club too, meaning we want to be that beacon of light on the shore we don't care how often that boat gets tossed around, how many people get sick on that boat. As long as that boat doesn't crash into the rocks, we're okay. Yeah. So we want those kids to get together, to break up, to deny each other. All those things that happen in adolescence. But as long as it's happening in our four walls and they're not making horrific choices, 99% um, of our kids aren't getting pregnant young. It's the number one indicator in this country. If, if, if a girl gets pregnant young, they're pretty much guaranteed to go on some form of government assistance in yeah. their life. Yeah. Let them Talk about a trajectory down, yeah. So let these kids mess up. Let them, let them cheat on each other, whatever the term is, at 12 years old. Let them, let them do these things. Just let them do it in a safe environment. Now, on top of that, something that you may not think of, some of our more successful programs, we have a Smart Girls and Smart Moves program. That won national recognition at our conference a few years ago because these programs are just for girls or just for boys with, with a staff person. And depending on their age, 7 to 9, of course, different issues, right? Then 10 to 13-year-olds have other issues. And I don't even want to talk about the 14 to 17-year-old issues. But they get to meet with a staff person. Maybe they don't have a dad in their life. But what are some of the challenges that are facing a 13-year-old boy as they go through puberty? They get to ask these questions. And they get educated on things. Hygiene uh, for the girls, you know, things that are changing in their bodies. They get to have these, they get someone who is not judging them and they get to ask these questions. Because these girls and boys are literally going through 
their most challenging life stages inside of our clubs. So when I say our staff are like family to them, they're the ones they're going to. And not to make a, you know, turn this into a dark subject, I'll also share with you that unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, the rate at which our kids share with us about sexual abuse that's happening in their life or adults that are preying on them is so much higher than it is that they do with their counselors at school or their teachers because of the, the bond they have with our staff. Yeah. And so while it's a horrific thing to share, our kids feel that they can come to us with some of those terrible things that happened in their life. In local parentis in the truest, fullest sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the nuclear world that we live in, family-wise, an absolute essential thing. So glad you're here doing that. So glad you're bringing your special skill and vision to it. So glad that uh, Aloha United Way helps you out. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for having me today. It's been truly an honor. Appreciate it. Thank Great you. Great to have you here. That's Tim Motts, President and CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii. We'll do this again. Aloha.